the inside story on the issues that affect you and your community. This is Local 12 Newsmakers. Good morning and welcome to Local 12 Newsmakers. I'm Dan Hurley. Between the election in November and December 19th, uh, the new Cincinnati City Council was deeply divided over the future of the streetcar. During the debate, three members of council, P.G. Sittenfeld, David Mann, Kevin Flynn, shifted their positions and voted to resume construction. Throughout the campaign debate and the vote, Amy Murray stood firm in her opposition. But two weeks ago, council members Murray and Dave Mann uh, accompanied longtime rail advocate John Schneider on one of his many trips to Portland. Over the last uh, 20 years, Schneider has taken hundreds of Cincinnatians on study tours of Portland to help them understand that the city's streetcar and light rail systems inter re interrelate. I am joined this morning by council member Amy Murray to talk about her observations of Portland's rail system and some other things that she's been working on. Welcome to Newsmakers. Thank Welcome you. back to Newsmakers. Thank you for Welcome having back me. to Cincinnati from that big trip to Portland and to Washington, D.C. Yes. Which is why we do. we'll get to that in a few minutes. Um, why go to Portland at this point with John Schneider? That is a great, great question. So as you said in the introduction, I did not vote for the streetcar to go forward. Because, we, we noticed that. You know, and even once I looked at the financials, I just thought, we can't afford it at this time. And so I voted against it. Now I, I'm chair of major transportation and regional cooperation committee. So the streetcar is under my committee. Mm -hmm. So we have responsibility now to make sure that the streetcar comes in on time, on budget, we find a way to pay for the operating cost, mm -hmm. and importantly, that it's an open and transparent process. So that, because I think before people were always concerned, how much money is it? You know, then we needed the city needed more money for it. So I'm trying to have everything be very open and transparent. So as chair of major transportation, I thought I should go to Portland. This trip is going there. We'll have a chance to talk to the people from Portland Streetcar Inc. to really find out what did they do right. And what did they do wrong so that we can learn from you know their, their building of and their they've been car. at it a long time they've been at it their first streetcar came on in 2001 and it took them about 10 years before that where they were getting consensus and public opinion to go forward with their streetcar and i think that's something that's uh, hard for people sometimes in as a new initiative like this takes place yes it's like does this initial streetcar line that was being built now answer all the problems are all the questions no it yeah. doesn't it's the beginning just like Portland has added to its streetcar many times well exactly so Portland's done seven different phases and right. so they're finally in maybe their final phase that connects it all into a circle so it's like a 7.4 mile loop around the area and so it's definitely for them been an economic development tool and it does provide transportation it connects to a, a light rail also I have to ask a question. I've also been to Portland with yes. John Schneider about 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. Were you invited to go earlier when you were on council before? Did you? Did John ever ask you to, to go? You know what, and I think it happened with this time. They send a note to all council members saying we're having a trip that's right. going to Portland. Do you want to go? So I, w I don't recall being personally invited, okay. and we may or may not have received that. But I traveled a lot in my future life with Procter & Gamble, mm -hmm. so I've ridden streetcars many times. I, I think in the old council, they had asked who's ridden a streetcar before, mm -hmm. and, and I was the only one that raised my hand. So I've used transportation, okay. you know, throughout the U.S. and, and Asia and Europe. Um, so, so I've had that experience, but I really wanted to talk to the people that, that put this system together. What, what are your key observations about what you experienced in Portland that you think are transferable back here and important to keep in mind as Cincinnati moves forward? So there was one big takeaway for me. So I wasn't sure how they financed their whole system and how this worked. And from the very beginning, phase one, the city wasn't driving it. It was being driven by property owners that wanted a streetcar there that felt that it would help their property value. Mm -hmm. And so they worked together first in every single phase. It was the property owners along that, that link. And they put together assessment districts. And and so they assess the people along the uh, property line or mm -hmm. the, the streetcar line um, to cover some of the capital cost. And this is before the city ever got involved. And that helped pay, depending on the phase, anywhere between 20% of the capital 
cost and 60 percent. So my learning really is they had public support first because as they said if you don't have they had local public they had support. local public support of people that are on the route that said this is going to help my business it's going to draw more people here it's going to help me when I sell it yes we want the route to come and I'm willing to have an assessment along you know the, the people that live on the route so that was critical because in every phase they had to do it and it wasn't always easy you know they had people on the ground level that had to get other people interested explain the situation to them and they said if, if you don't have the property owners along the route saying it's worth it and we'll you know put some money in then it's probably not going to be successful and part of that is because and you mentioned people along the route recognize that property values go up yes and depending on when you're doing this when you know pre-recession post-recession there can be all sorts of numbers yes. that are out there but it's seen as an investment tool, a development tool, not just a transportation tool. No, you are right, and the property owners are the ones that benefit it, so they said, yes, we want to have skin in the game. We want to put in some money so that it can be built. And so for me, that was such a big takeaway because I didn't realize they'd done that from phase one. So what, what's, the, what's the transference back to Cincinnati, do you think? So what's a little frustrating for me is that hasn't happened here. The city really wanted this in previous administration and said, we'll fund it, we'll manage to, to get the money uh, you know, with taxpayer dollars instead of going along the route and saying, let's look at this type of assessment. And, and as you said, there's been 20 plus trips to Portland, so people knew that this is how Portland did it. So I feel like we're, we're kind of, at, we've gone too fast, too far. And if we asked people along the route right now, okay, we'd like to do an assessment, what do you think? I don't think that they'd want an assessment because it's already coming. But when the grassroots movement emerged in December, yes. actually there were people uh, talking about that yes. and saying that they were open to that. Yes, and, and so on my committee, the first meeting of every month of the uh, major trans transportation committee, I have the streetcar executives come and we talk about all these issues, how we're going to pay operating costs, should we do an assessment? And for me, it, it's just been... It, I've been pushing and saying, if you guys want to do the assessment, you've changed your mind because of this assessment, where are we? And I'm not finding people standing up saying, let me take the leadership on this. Okay. So we're looking into it right now because I think, you know, if, you know, some people are saying we need a phase two, a phase three, mm -hmm. I think we've got to do it after the Portland model and people along the route have to have, you know, have to have money in the game. How, you know, people debate whether that phase two the phase two is getting up the hill to clifton phase three is probably getting around exactly. that huge employment area up in clifton mm -hmm. um what's your view about the importance of that coming sure. back <laughs> um you know for me it's all financials i mean we're still trying to you know we we've not solved the pension issue but we put together a good plan that may make our pension solvent in, in the next 30 years. Mm -hmm. We still have to structurally balance our budget, which is 22 million short. Mm -hmm. And we need to do that not just by one-time use, but really structurally balance it. So I'm very concerned about adding any additional costs to our general fund. I do think the streetcar, it, of course, if it goes up to the Clifton area and you see it around campus, I think you'll definitely have more people that ride it and it's a better transportation option. But I still come from the fiscal side, how are we paying for it? And, and you got a lot of institutions in Clifton. I mean, yes. it's the second largest uh, employment district in the region, second only to the downtown. Exactly. And so there's a lot of institutions up there who have a lot of trouble moving people around. Because mm -hmm. you have to get in your car and go to a meeting. If you work at Children's Hospital and you have to go to a meeting over on main campus, yeah. it's a nightmare. Well, it is, and in Portland, the interesting thing, too, is a streetcar goes right through the university, so Absolutely. students ride it. But so I, I think we're at a point where the city, that we can't afford it. We can't do it ourselves. So if people really want it, I think before the city applies for grants or does anything, we have to have property owners saying, this is something we want, and we're willing to put money into this. Okay. So that's sort of a key. you got to get local buy-in, and you got you need we need to find someone or some ones, some people mm -hmm. who will lead that effort to say we need that. Well, absolutely. And there are, there are other models that that's already happened. Um, DCI mm -hmm. is sort of a 
developed in, in the downtown area that yes. same way with people taxing themselves, businesses mm -hmm. and frontage. And they do it downtown and it's been very successful because right. it makes the downtown clean and safe and the ambassadors right. are there and it's a wonderful program. So, you know, I'm just interested right now in phase one because that's something that council already voted on. Mm -hmm. So I just want to make sure and if people want to come down to our meetings, you know, we try and be very open. We, we want to make sure it's on budget. It's on time. Is and, it on um, budget? It is right now. And is it on time? It is right now. Okay. So it should be uh, operational September of 2016. And when they come to our meetings, what can we do to help? Because we need to make sure that this happens. We don't have extra money to John throw at Dietrich it. John Dietrich is the person who is driving that construction project. Yes. Did you know John Dietrich bef from your other time on council or in your past? No, I did not know John before. And so we're working together on this. And, and I think it's been, you know, a good collaboration. You know, maybe early on when, when people knew I was heading transportation and I voted against the streetcar but you know it is coming so I need to you know, protect the taxpayer dollars and do what I can to make sure that we get it you know that it gets in there and John's uh, such successful. a quiet person but when you see what he's done with the reconfiguration of uh, Fort Washington way yes. and then what uh, he did in Washington DC mm -hmm. when he be took over transportation there I mean he is an amazing he's an engineer I mean he is. he's an engineer but the one thing I saw that Portland has that we don't either is they have an advisory committee okay. that is selected by the transportation committee and it's stakeholders in it and it's certain seats you know one for property owners and one for council and I think we need that to really look at the current streetcar and where it's going because we still don't know how we're paying for the operating costs okay. for the first phase of the streetcar and, and that's a big concern so you know I think we need to really be focused on that one of the things about Portland, in fact, when I went there, yeah. I didn't know anything about the streetcar. I'd been, I was totally focused on my way out there mm -hmm. on the light rail system because the streetcar is only a component of a total system yes. out there. Did you have a chance to take a look at the light rail system as oh, well? Oh, I did. So we, we rode on the light rail, we rode on the streetcar, and I've always been a strong proponent of light rail. Yeah. Personally, I'd rather see a light rail. I flew into the airport and took their light rail downtown. So I would much rather see that in the greater Cincinnati area you know from our airport to downtown or Mason you know that 71 75 corridor it's all becoming part of Cincinnati all the way up to Dayton Absolutely. so and I you, think your charge uh, your, your committee is regional cooperation right? yes it, so it, it fits well together but I think that that's where we would need light rail well did you back in 2002 did you support Metro moves I don't remember you know I wasn't involved in politics and I was busy working at Procter and Gamble so okay. but but I do that's support when we light had rail. the chance and we yeah we turned our back on it I know and that's when and some people said, well, let's start small yeah. with a streetcar. I want to get, before we run out of time, I want to get to one other topic. You've been working very hard on the bid for Cincinnati to bring the Republican National Convention here. Absolutely. Where does that stand? So last, last Friday. Last fact. Friday. So last Friday, a group of us went to Washington, D.C. and uh, made a bid to the Site Selection Committee or, or to the Convention Selection Committee. And there were about 25 people there. Uh, that were interviewing us and we had a great presentation. Uh, Dan Lincoln from the Convention Center helped us. John Barrett is really leading this. Greg Hartman and Alex Trantafilu was there. We put together a great binder that just told the story of Cincinnati, mm -hmm. why the convention should be here. And you know, when I look at all the other cities that are bidding for it, I mean, Cincinnati should have it. Mm -hmm. And we are, we are uniquely positioned to have this. So of people that would be coming to the convention, because of where the arena is, 40% of the people that come could walk to the arena. So in past conventions, whether it's a Republican or Democrat, transportation is always an issue. So our city is so walkable and we've joined forces with Northern Kentucky. So we'll have the hotels over there throughout the downtown area, 40% can walk to that arena. And if you think about all the other areas we have, because it would be 50 states coming in and they all want you know, their own area. Mm -hmm. If we work with Northern Kentucky with their uh, arena, with uh, Cintas Center, with UC's facilities, with the Downtown Convention Center, Sharonville, we have so many opportunities for, for them to come. And I think politically, you know, Ohio is a state that the Republicans need. A swing and vote. Swing, swing vote. Swing, and especially in Hamilton County. So, uh, you know, it's really wonderful that I could go there and sell our city and I think we put together a great package and video that hope maybe we can go for other larger conventions also what what's our biggest problem that maybe we have to answer or get past to convince them to come here 
Well, and that is it, because the next, the next opportunity, they'll pick two or three cities to do a site visit. Right. So for me, I think once they do the site visit, because if people haven't been to Cincinnati recently, we have so much going on down in the banks. So I think getting them here for the site visit, you know, that, that's the, the hard part. So do you part think of one of the big problems is we don't have a reputation that would make it sound like an interesting place to come? Well, because another city that's bidding for it is Vegas, who hosts so many conventions. Yeah. And so, you know, but I think... And it's set up to be a convention. And it's set up to be a convention. So I, I think we did a good job of saying, you know, we have the ability here to host it. And, you know, if you think about it, it would be 50,000 political leaders, business leaders coming for our city. I think it's a huge economic development tool for people to come and say, I didn't know all of this was in Cincinnati. When will you hear whether or not we're going to get a site visit? So we're waiting, you know, I, I would think by next week we will hear what cities will get okay, site we're visits. We're taping on Thursday morning, this will air on Sunday yes. morning, something could even happen. We but. could have it. So our plan is if we do hear that we have a site visit, we'll do a press conference within a couple of hours. And then once the site visit is over, when will the decision be made about what city will actually get it? They'll be making it, from what I hear, mid to late summer of what city will get it. And this is for 2016, and right. it will be June or July. Okay. A another great spot that we have is some of the other cities have, whether it's hockey or some of the, the teams that are tying up the arena, if mm -hmm. they're in finals, that go until May or June. Oh, luckily and we don't we have, have that. Luckily, we don't have we any don't have hockey <laughs> or basketball yeah. teams that yes. will be in the finals yeah. of anything. So, but actually, yeah. that was a positive point because we were able to walk point. in these spaces. So it was wonderful to go and represent the city, and uh, okay. hopefully, this is a start of, of getting big conventions here. Uh, and there's a history of conventions. W well, and, and we can talk about that. I'm out of time absolutely. right now. Absolutely. But we'll talk about the 19th century conventions when we had the best convention hall of the late 19th century. Which, which we now know is Music Hall. Yes. But that's what it was built for. So, uh, thank you for being here. Thank you so much. Okay. Stay tuned after the break, a preview of an upcoming convention for local not-for-profit organizations. Passion Capital is the world's most valuable asset, and it is the key driver of success. It's more important than financial capital, human capital, intellectual capital, brand, and technological capital. Because if you have passion capital, as the way I describe it, you can acquire all those other forms of capital. Welcome back. The post-Great Recession period has been tough, not only on for-profit businesses, but also for not-for-profit businesses. In this community, we have seen a number of agency mergers. I focused several years uh, ago on two shows about the challenges of merging the cultures of Family Service and Claremont County Family Counseling Center into LifePoint Solutions. Other well-established organizations like the 75-year-old Bridges for a Just Community went out of business last fall, and last month the 40-year-old Urban Appalachian Council uh, announced that it's closing its doors. Not-for-profit businesses employ tens of thousands of people in our region and are vital to the well-being of the local economy and society. As a result of a Leadership Cincinnati project 13 years ago, local not-for-profits across the social service and arts spectrums gather for the Securing the Future conference every year to explore the best practices in the rapidly changing not-for-profit environment. This year's conference will take place Tuesday, April the 8th at the Cintas Center and feature Paul Aloffs, who we heard at the top of this segment. The program for Securing the Future uh, conference is planned each year by a committee of leadership Cincinnati graduates in collaboration with the Cincinnati USA Regional Chamber. I am joined this morning by two members of this year's planning team, Jenny Berg, the Executive Director of the Leadership Council of Human Services Executives, and Nick Nisley, the Dean of Business Technologies uh, at Cincinnati State. He also serves on the Board of Directors of the Lower Price Hill Community School. Both are graduates of Class 35 of Leadership Cincinnati, and I had to get that plug in uh, because we're recruiting right now. So, welcome to Newsmakers. Um, what's, Jenny, what's the sort of overall theme? Every year, Securing the Future has sort of, a, has a real focal point, and that drives who the speakers are. Mm -hmm. uh, but what's, what's the theme this year? The theme this year is really about capital, different forms of capital. As you heard Paul say, it was about passion capital. And the other speaker, Nell, you'll hear her talk about capacity capital. Nell Edgington, so, right? Nell Edgington, correct. Uh, right. Yes. And uh, it, capital can be, has been 
kind of in a negative terms in the past couple of years in our markets, but the nonprofit community can really use capital in many different forms, both in the passion form as well as the capital to, uh, capacity capital to build the infrastructure. Nick, passion capital, just elaborate a little bit on what Paul Eloffs was saying. He's saying it's the yeah. most important kind of of capital and and he's coming for for from a for-profit world into the not-for-profit world so he's talking about it in both environments right yeah well as dean of a business school i'm very excited by this idea because it gives us a new way of thinking about capital and we should know too that paul is ceo of the princess margaret foundation a cancer research foundation in toronto where he's raised over 750 million dollars in the last 10 years almost a billion dollars but he also has experience as a CEO in the for-profit world. And what he has done in this book, Passion Capital, is kind of told the story of his life story as an executive and what he's learned, the lessons along the way. Passion Capital, I think he touches on things like emotion, like energy, those things we normally don't talk about in business, or surely when we think about capital. A lot of times we give lip service to things like uh, human resources being our most valuable asset. Paul takes it to the next level and says it's not just the people, but it's how we develop those people to bring their best to work. Jenny, who do you hope comes to this conference? I mean, this has been, this is the 13th year, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, a, it's been successful. It's got a built-in audience to mm -hmm. some extent, but I know you're trying to grow that audience. Who right. do you hope comes? Well, we think this, audi this uh, these speakers will both appeal to a wide variety of people, not just in the non nonprofit community, but those people who serve on the boards of the nonprofit community. So many of our business leaders, um, young professionals will be, uh, I think, have their eyes opened by both what Paul and Nell are saying. And I think it really has an appealing factor for just about anybody that is interested in our community. We've re referenced Nell Edgington several times. Mm -hmm. What's sort of her role in this conference and what's her niche in this in this wider environment, Nick? Yeah, I think she builds nicely on Paul's work of passion capital as she talks about capacity capital. So again, another way of thinking differently about capital in an organization. And she tends to think of that as how we build an organization. A not-for-profit's revenue is how we run the organization, kind of the day-to-day -day business but she says we got to get beyond that we need to think about how do we actually grow and build the capacity of not-for-profits so her idea of uh, capacity capital I think is going to help stretch our imaginations a little bit and Jenny this conference the securing the future conference actually builds towards uh, another session which uh, is a little bit later right. um, and is being run strictly by your organization, right? Yes, the Leadership Council is pleased to partner with the Better Business Bureau this year and we are bringing in Art Taylor who is the CEO of the Better Business Bureau Wise Giving Alliance and Art and the CEOs of GuideStar and Charity Navigator all authored a letter basically to the donors of America last summer about we need to stop measuring nonprofits strictly on this idea of overhead ratio. And so it does build on, on what Nell is talking about and the idea that we need to think about how we evaluate nonprofits differently. That overhead shouldn't be the only measure. There are other things, perhaps passion capital, perhaps uh, these idea of the capacity capital, one-time infusions of money into the nonprofit community to build their sustainability so that they can do even, have even greater impact on our larger community. It also relates back to this conference several years ago uh, when Dan Pilata mm -hmm. was in town exactly. and spoke about that. It was an right. incredibly important conference yes. I really think opened a lot of people's eyes. So. What types of people? Employees of these not-for-profits? Who else? Yeah, I tend to think of three main groups. It's any leader in a not-for-profit and or a manager, but also board members who might be involved in the governance. Yeah. And I think across sectors, you know, we're talking about, you know, from education to human services. I think anyone who's in the not-for-profit uh, organization world is going to benefit from this conference. Yeah. And, and funders as well. And grant makers are... Um, are also more than welcome to come to either of these events on the 8th and the 16th and I think they will have we all have to start thinking differently about how we fund our nonprofit. You've got these two major speakers. Mm -hmm. What's the dynamics of this? Do people who come, is there interaction, is there a chance to 
interact with the people who are there? Um, yes, actually, we have that built into the conference. There'll be an interactive about an hour and 15 minutes. And we, eat, we have a table host at each of the tables who will be passion ambassadors, we're calling them. And they will be answering, asking the group at the tables individual questions. And then our two keynotes will be wandering around, listening to what's being uh, said in the, in the, at the tables, and then wrap that up. Um, and, and that'll happen really at both of our events on the 8th and 16th. Nick, we're just about out of time, but what do you hope is the takeaway? What's the goal here? What's the takeaway for people who attend? I think two things. One, our imaginations get stretched. And two, we probably start to realize that we've got some wonderful passion capitalists in this community. And how do we invite them into the not-for-profits to do even more? Do you have somebody in mind? Oh, there's many I have in mind. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can think of... Right off the top of my head, Auto Buddy comes to, yes. to mind real quickly yes. as somebody who is uh, passionate about everything he does. So mm -hmm. anyway, make sure that people uh, know how to do it. Uh, get there. The Securing the Future conference is Tuesday, April the 8th from 8 to 1.30 at the Cintas Center at, uh, on Xavier's campus. The registration is $79. That includes a copy of Paul Aloff's book and lunch. Uh, you can register online at CincinnatiChamber.com or call 513-579-3111. Thank you for being here this morning. Good Thanks, luck with man. the conference. And thank you for making Newsmakers a part of your Sunday morning. Join us again next week to meet the men and the women working for a better future for the people of our region. Have a good week.